Um, we were starting in one minute. They will tell me when we're live. Sorry. Yes. Okay, hello everyone. A warm welcome to the Youth Dialogue hosted by the FAO Liaison Office in Geneva. A very good morning, afternoon, and good evening to you all, wherever you might be joining us. My name is Yinin, and I'm a young professional officer at the FAO Liaison Office in Geneva, and I'll be co-moderating today's session along with Xiaoyi Wang, Mathilde Bouldock, and who is joining us virtually, um, Judy Kimanen. And my other colleagues here, Shivani and Jiyu, will also be moderating the chat in case you have any questions. So today's dialogue will be guided by three main questions. One, how can we create awareness of the global hunger crisis and the challenges facing our global agri-food systems among the youth? Two, how can we engage with the youth to be actively involved in discussing the issues, sharing knowledge and identifying solutions? And three, how can the youth act as agents of change and drive sustainable transformation of agri-food systems to support the SDGs and end hunger? Before starting our event, a few housekeeping details. The webinar will be in English with one presenta presentation done by a speaker in French, but her presentation will be written in English. Um, and the whole dialogue will be recorded and will be uh, available to watch later on the Air, Air Meet platform. It's scheduled to last one hour and 30 minutes. Please submit any questions that you might have in the Q&A, and we will try our best to answer them. So that's all for housekeeping rules. To start our program, I would now like to give the floor to our um, director of the FAO Liaison Office in Geneva, Mr. Dominique Peugeon, to open the dialogue. Thank you very much, uh, Emin. And let me tell you that I'm very, very happy to be uh, to be with you uh, this morning here in Geneva, but also uh, uh, virtually through the, the, the virtual platform. So, uh, dear participants and colleagues, uh, youth, of course, are at the front line of today's uh, global challenges. They stand to face an uncertain future, unfortunately, influenced by the decisions we make today and are already bearing significant impact from crises our, of our planet, such as climate change, ecosystem degradation, biodiversity loss, water and water scarcity. In 2020, among children under five years of age, 149 million were stunted from malnutrition. Stunted means being too short for your age, meaning cognitive problems in the future. It's a huge issue. And 40, 149 million means 22% of the children under five years of age. So it's a huge issue. Unemployment rates for youth are also three times higher than for the rest of the working age population in all regions of the world, with the majority of unemployed youth being young women. These problems have, of course, all been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic putting livelihoods and jobs at risk. Yet, as advocates and active citizens, youth have a, a lot uh, to offer. They have demonstrated their transformative power, inspiring worldwide movements to drive the urgently needed change. We must support and celebrate this passion, creativity and commitment of youth as key drivers of positive change. To do so, we also need to address challenges that they face. We need to give youth a seat at the table so that their voice are heard during policy-making processes. Access to jobs, finance, markets, and education must be increased so that they have an enabling environment to engage. Indeed, we need a coordinated response to increase youth involvement in agri-food system as youth play a pivotal role in ensuring a food secure future for themselves and for future generations. The Youth Committee at FAO has launched the World Food Forum to mobilize and provide opportunities for youth to pro propose solutions to the challenge we face today, from food insecurity to climate change. 
created for and led by youth, it aims to spark a movement to transform agri-food systems and manage to eradicate hunger and all forms of malnutrition. In this spirit, and I must say very much inspired by our contact with the youth in Switzerland, including at the recent Scout Jamboree in Valais, but also by our contact with schools and, uh, and Swiss-based uh, institutions, it was very clear for the FAO office in Geneva that we needed to be part of that, that we needed to support uh, that movement and that we needed to contribute to the World Food Forum through, uh, I would say, Swiss-based, Swiss-led event, uh, which really we see as the beginning of a, of a movement also here in Switzerland that we can and that we will uh, for sure support in the coming, uh, in the coming weeks and months uh, to uh, really showcase projects and initiatives that you are leading here, here in Switzerland, that you are that you have the opportunity to exchange with your peers all over the world, and that uh, we can together work uh, towards uh, eradicating hunger and all forms of malnutrition. With that, uh, Aileen, I want to give, back, to give you back the floor and wish you uh, a very successful event. Thank you, Dominique. Uh, next, I will hand over to Judy to introduce our speakers. Over to you, Judy. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Inan. My name is Judy Kimani, and I work at the FAO Liaison Office in Geneva. We are pleased to have with us several active, innovative, and inspiring speakers today who will intervene on the topic of youth for agri-food systems transformation. We are joined by speakers from the Youth Parliament Swiss Abroad, Scouts from Fandi, Peter, and Paul, and the World Association of Girl Guides and Girl Scouts as well as few students from the Graduate Institute and colleagues from BioVision and UNITA. Thank you all very much for agreeing to be with us today, and we are looking forward to your presentations. I now give the floor back to Inan <clears throat> to moderate the first session. Thank you. We can't hear the room. Can you hear us now? Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah, there are people, these are people joining us. Yeah, so I'll give a few seconds for people to join us and then we will start. It's a very short quiz just to test your awareness on food security. I'll wait maybe um, 30 more seconds and then we'll start. All right, shall we begin? So the first question is a multiple choice, so you pick what you think is the right answer. What is the estimated number of people who cannot afford a healthy diet in 2020? And you have one minute to answer. Ah. 
So, 15 seconds left. Please do not Google the answers. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so seems like most of us um, got the correct answer. It's 3.1 billion people. But um, I would like to now give the floor to the, the presenters now. Um, so the first speakers are Francisca and Jan of the Youth Parliament of Swiss Abroad. Please, um, please answer the question and share us your thoughts. Thank you. I so we may proceed. Yes, please. Okay. Let me just share the screen. Can you all see? Yes. <clears throat> okay. Well, uh, hello everyone. I am Jan, the Vice President of uh, IPSA, and I'm delighted to be here with you uh, all to be able to discuss this uh, really important topic. Uh, thank you uh, again to everyone who is making this event possible, and thanks to Aki to inviting us to this interesting event. And just before uh, digging into the topic, I would just uh, want to quickly present you what's uh, IPSA, so the Youth Parliament for the Swiss Abroad. Um, so um, our purpose is to create community for all young Swiss people aged between 15 to 35 uh, living abroad or who have lived abroad for 10 years. Uh, this association wants to give everyone the possibility to exchange information, um, share experiences and opinion, and it is completely managed by, by young people, but we work very closely with uh, OSA, which is an organization, uh, uh, the organization of the Swiss abroad, and they want also to raise awareness of the needs of young uh, Swiss living abroad, but they do it on a larger scale and, of course, more professionally because IPSA is just managed by young people. Um, IPSA was founded in 2015 in Geneva, uh, in the first meeting of uh, the uh, Swiss abroad. And, and also, yeah, we have been able to create local young Swiss communities in many different countries such as Chile, Italy, and, and Austria. And here's just a quick uh, photo of our actual committee. So we from many different places. So we mostly do our meetings online. Uh, yeah. And also we've been uh, collaborating with different Swiss entities, such as uh, Easy Vote, which is an organization that tries to simplify the federal votes uh, for young people. Uh, I've uh, personally already used it, so uh, it's very useful. I don't know if you you, you know about it, but yeah. Uh, also with the Swiss Info, uh, currently with a project uh, it's called Dacher Ban Schweizer, who will improve uh, young uh, needs, and and yeah, and also for, with the Parliament of the, the young Swiss. Um, but now coming back to our main topic, so how can we create awareness of the global hunger uh, crisis and the challenges facing our glo global agri food system among, among the youth? Um, so we thought about it, and at first, we think the answer will always depend on the context of world peace and cooperation from the government. Otherwise, it will be difficult to, to respond to this uh, issue because it, it may change every time the the, the proposal we, 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 we give to the table, but we, but we raised a few problems. Um, so the first one is fewer lands for agriculture. Uh, I think, yeah, I mean, yeah, everyone knows. I mean, every time we're uh, producing more and more, so we're lacking of uh, land. Uh, then uh, we thought about lack of knowledge and awareness uh, for this issue. Uh, also, one is water as a vital is becoming currently a scar resource. Uh, yeah, just a quick source from UNICEF uh, it says that 4 billion people, almost two thirds of the world's population, uh, experience severe water scarcity for at least one month uh, a year. So it's 
it's, uh, it's a main problem with the, this um, hunger crisis. And also, I mean, one of the biggest one, maybe I think it's uh, the intensification of climate change, who's causing uh, more droughts, fires and, and floods. And, and so we thought about a couple of solutions that could help uh, reduce uh, this problem. Uh, and we, we divided in different uh, pillars. And the first one uh, we thought about is, uh, of course, education. I mean, everyone knows that the first step in solving a problem is to acknowledge that there is a problem. So we have to, from the beginning, raise awareness. I mean, we think among young people, because we are, of course, the product of our education, of our living, and that fortress our values. And so if we can indulge young people about this global issue, uh, the earlier, so the better. Uh, next, uh, sorry. Um, next, uh, want to inform the youth of the reality of the global hunger crisis. And by saying that, I mean that showing them, um, for example, how to cook, so they can be aware of, for example, how many vegetables, how many food is involved in one dish. Uh, so they can be aware of what's the need behind every meal or a couple of them. And also to maybe ask them or encourage them to go uh, uh, to the grocery store maybe once a week to, to, yeah, to show them how, I mean, to show them how much plastic, for example, is involved in, in buying one vegetable or one thing on, or another, so they can be more proactive in this um, um, in this issue. And a final one uh, that we we thought about in, in this theme was uh, to promote agronomy studies and improve salaries maybe in that sector, uh, because the the concern for the lack of food is in a growing population as many scientists. Uh, strive to increase current production and take advantage of the soil for crops, as the soil is a limited asset for mankind. So it's very important to promote studies in different stages of food uh, production. And also agriculture today is highly technological, as we, we can see. And so I think it is, it is essential to have uh, trained people for managing this uh, new technology. Uh, yeah, and now we'll um, hand over to the president of IPSA, uh, Francisca. Uh, thank you, Jan. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Perfect. Thank you. Um, well, thank you so much for this invitation and continuing our presentation. Our second pillar for, from our proposal is, well, awareness. We strongly believe in the importance of supporting and collaborating with different organizations, regardless of whether they are exclusively dedicated to agriculture or not, as everything is intrinsically connected. Organizations, for example, such as WWF Youth, which is the world's leading independent conservation organization in which is dedicated in part to making our food system sustainable or UNICEF, and of course, the organizations that are present at, the, at this forum today. We think that everyone has something to give and to contribute. Also, that it's very important, it all starts from ourselves, learning, studying, studying, and raising awareness and acting. Don't expect that change come from others. You have to learn to be the example yourself. Above all, it is Jews, it is the youth um, who have the moral duty to lead this change. Um, about the last topic of this uh, slide, um, it is important to ensure that food handlers throughout the production chain comply with established hygiene practices. All employees, part-time and full-time must be trained in these practices in agriculture as well basic food production must comply with sanitary pro protocols. Um, when there are new workers, while they're undergoing training, it should be the supervisors, the ones to provide the basic knowledge to prevent food contamination. It is not only the workers who must be aware of the standards uh, to be complied with, but also the management of a food production company. 
they must be aware of the basic procedures relating to hygienic and sanitary practices of workers and process during the packing and the transfer of food intended for human consumption. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, our third proposal is technology and science. Um, first, new ways to promote water use in routes. Due to the recent changes in climatic conditions and the scarcity of rainfall in large areas, as my teammate told you, it is necessary to invest in technologies to avoid the disaster caused by droughts in agriculture. It is essential that governments aware of this climatic alteration prepare and invest in the protection of aquifers for human consumption and agriculture, promote the use of irrigation technologies such as drip irrigation and others. Second, improving food storage systems. With increasing food production due to new technologies and genetic improvement of crops and increasing trade, food has to withstand the long periods of time between production, sale, and consumption in the best transport and storage conditions. Today, they are efficient food storage systems such as refrigerators and canned food. Third, uh, vertical plantations. And this is one of the most important, we think. Soil is a limited asset in the productive and living structure for human beings. Um, today, technology in search of the best use of resources has designed what is known as vertical gardens in which high technology must be applied and a high production is obtained. Vertical farms are cultivation in multi-store buildings and this reduced the surface area to be worked the limitation today is the investment, but also because um, they work in controlled environments once your consumption is reduced. Fourth, water desalinization. With the increasing scarcity of water in the near future, industries that require large quantities of water for their process will have to invest in water desalinization technologies to obtain the input for their industry, mainly in the mining industry. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, finally, public policies. Um, first, it is important that governments promote new public policies in agriculture. At present, the time of change, with increasing influence of internal and external factors in any society, positive and, cre and creative attitudes are required to transform problems into challenges, generate opportunities to conquer markets, increase the general welfare of the population and generate cutting edge technology adapted to ec ecological and human conditions. Information exchange mechanisms must be established supported by current technology to improve business and professional structures in order to successfully face the challenges of the present, which will be the success of the future. And second, uh, importance of encouraging agro-industry. As mentioned above, there are increasing volumes of food production, which is very difficult to consume fresh, in addition to the distance involved. Agroindustry is a way of pre preserving these foods, merely, not only for the journeys involved, but also for long-term preservation. This is why the growth of agroindustry is essential for maximum utilization of agricultural production. Next slide, please. Thank you. So um, our conclusions for our presentation is that um, we think that uh, we have solutions under the scenarios outlined above. We think also that youth should know that the first thing is to ensure world peace, as my teammate says, said, and favorable government policies. Science has developed many breakthroughs in several parallel areas, which make possible an agri-food system to feed the population in the face of adverse environmental events, such as droughts, lack of fresh water, and other challenges. 
Firstly, we, we can cite research in genetics, where increasingly plants are being developed that are suitable for the environment in which they will grow. Second, um, we all know that fresh water is a non-renewable resource. Apart from the sustainable policies that must be in place in every government to take mm -hmm. care of this resource, there is already large-scale domestic machinery, machinery and equipment to desalinate water up to drinking water purification levels. Uh, third, as irrigation becomes increasingly scarce and to escape adverse, adverse drought scenarios, there are high technology vertical farming installation that we said it before. And these systems are highly productive and in just a few square meters, can produce the equivalent of hundreds of hectares of outdoor land with control of light, pest, and disease. In the end, uh, there are several technologies that can support a very productive and sustainable agriculture. But the adults who govern the world from institution, institutions such as the United Nations and governments must ensure world peace and ensure that governments have clear governance policies by their example, and by their example can raise awareness of today's youth. The rest, we think, is done by science and youth who must ensure technology transfer from developed to undeveloped countries. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so. Finally, we would like to mention our communications channels. We have Instagram, Facebook, our website, and our mail account. And if you want to contact with us, we will be very happy to, uh, to see you. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Francisca and Jan. Thanks for sharing your insights. Um, I agree that if we want change, we must start with ourselves. Um, just, we will quickly move on now before we take questions to our next speaker, Raphael, a scout leader and chef from the scout, um, Fadi Peter Hall. So Raphael, please go ahead. Thank you much. I guess this presentation should just... Perfect. So, yes, how we how we generate awareness at the youth in the during the scout camps because we have like uh, we have scout uh, sessions every week like on the Saturday afternoon but normally the long period are always the scout camps for example like the federal scout camp this summer for two weeks in Canton of Valle uh, which was. Uh, which happens every 14 years. So we yeah, we are Aoma uh, here sitting next to me and Mark Philip and myself. We are all uh, like now for several years scout leaders and our scout group is uh, a little bit situated in, on the opposite of Switzerland, like a nice far, far, far hour train ride from Geneva to St. Gallen. It's a very cool city. And at the moment, we are 138 members, aged from around four years old to 16 years old. And as well, we are 45 instructors, which are guiding the children in different act activities. In the scout, we have a uh, a scout principle, which which is called "We Scout Want to Take Care of Nature," uh, of nature, and this means that we also the nature we want to be respectful with our resources as well with the food which is included in this resource. And how we generate awareness during the scout camps? I want to show you two examples how we do this. One is the meat consumption. And with that, we did once uh, an experiment with uh, a traditional uh, Swiss meal with uh, elbow uh, pasta and mines. And uh, the, the experiment was that we replaced the beef with craw. And the funny thing about that is that no one outside the kitchen knew this, uh, that, uh, that there was no beef in it. And so 
uh, we told everyone that uh, there was not a beef in it. And so in the end, we, uh, we told everyone that there was no beef in it. And so we showed them that uh, meat is not always necessary uh, and show that the same paste could also be uh, generated with meatless products. And I guess then they, sh they have seen that it's, uh, it's not always necessary and as well that the meat uh, produces less CO2 and doesn't harm any animals. So it's, yes, it's a good replacement. The second one, which I want to introduce, is like how we uh, want to affect the food. Or we are, how we want to do the awareness of the food waste problematic. Like we in the during the scout camps in the kitchen, we are looking that we are doing a menu plan for the two weeks, and with this menu plan, we are calculating approximately all the food which is needed. And together with the calculated food, we are we are adding some basic foodstuffs, which with like uh, oil. Uh, that like oil, flour, sugar, and also bread comes, for example, which is mostly made of all the bread from uh, our breakfast. And so together with this, we have like a, a good basic, a good basis for uh, for regarding the food waste. The difficulty is during the scout camps that we have less cool, uh, really limited cooling possibilities. So we have to use the leftovers or the uh, or the rest, like we have to use leftovers very fast. So, for example, we have to use uh, something we cooked during lunch for the dinner, or if it's overnight, probably it's not, it's okay. But uh, we are looking that we are cooking the food very fast again. And so, what we are doing is like we are taking the leftovers, for example, uh, there are some rice, and we are adding basic food stuff. For example, uh, the bread comes, and with a little bit of creativity, we are doing. For example, uh, uh, rice balls, and that generate ex excellent dishes, as you can see in the last two images. Uh, the bread comes with a, a vegetable. We're generating like a new wrap, for example. And uh, Forest Kitchen is sometimes funny because uh, the, the the leftover dish is sometimes even better or than the original one, and so <laughs> we have to look that we don't cook extra leftovers for the traditions no exactly yeah so now that that's the first part of, i guess from our presentation and later we you're going to hear Kaoma and mark philip for the rest of our scout group and how we doing the scout the capacity to always treat themselves very good when it comes to food. <laughs> <laughs> you can see it here yeah the pictures look really yeah. <laughs> when do we do it <laughs> Um, but thanks for the great presentation. It's really cool to see how the scouts are using uh, plant-based meat options and reducing food waste. Um, and also because I think the scout network in Switzerland is the biggest youth network. Um, so there's a lot of potential to reach many young people. Um, so next we have our speakers, well, last speakers for the first session, um, Ambra and Amelia, uh, two master's students from the Graduate Institute. So please. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Amelia Giancarlo. Um, as we were just introduced, um, me and my colleagues here, Amra, India, and Martin, are all from the Graduate Institute here in Geneva. Um, and we are working on an applied research project in partnership with FAO. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit adjacent to that. Um, and then my colleagues will go into more detail about the work that we're doing in research that we've conducted. Um, but I'm going to kind of get straight to the point with the awareness raising. Um, so if you go to the next slide, please. I'm going to read this to you. I know it's kind of a big paragraph, but bear with me. So at six in the morning and a law student is walking her dog before the beginning of full day of classes. Across town a few hours later, a classmate rushes onto a crowded subway train, forced to stand sandwiched between strangers during his commute to school. That afternoon, an evening student sits in rush hour traffic, hoping to make it into the city in time for class. Later that night, a student jogs on a treadmill at the gym after a long day of school. Why am I saying all this? What do all these people have in common? They are doing all these things and simultaneously learning by listening to a podcast. Um, next slide, please. Um, so that was an excerpt from a study on the utility of podcasts, which was written actually way back in 2009, which if you can believe it is more than 10 years ago. Um, and the, uh, the article author, Vincent, argued um, that 
podcasts are an amazing pet pedagogical tool, which they are, and um, they can also be used as a way for those who are not in formalized education to access new info um, on the topics that interest them. So um, especially for youth that are no longer in school, but also for those that are, um, if you're interested in something and you don't have the chance to learn about it formally in a classroom, um, the amazing thing is that there are millions of podcasts today, um, and they are super accessible and often, um, especially today, um, easily digestible form of education. And so there is a podcast for everything, meditation, cooking weirdly, where you can't smell, taste, or see the food, but uh, you can learn about it. Um, there's movie critic podcasts, there's um, true crime podcasts, um, whatever you're into. Um, but we bring this up because um, our team decided that a good way to demonstrate and disseminate the work and research that we've been doing on um, the global hunger crisis and food security and peace building um, was to produce a podcast so that uh, more people could hear about what we learned about in a shorter and easily digestible way. And another amazing thing that we were able to do in a podcast was give the floor to the people who we learned from. So it wasn't just us saying, oh, we learned this and we learned that from this person. Um, we actually got those people to speak on the podcast. So there's a myriad of voices, um, which I think is also um, a really great way to keep people engaged, um, like today. Um, so uh, People, particularly young folks, are also more likely to click on a podcast rather than, you know, go on Google Scholar or on JSTOR and search up um, academic research that they have to sift through. Um, and so we thought that it's a really great and accessible way um, to learn something new. So I'll hand it to um, my colleague, Ambra, who will talk a little bit about our particular podcast. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. So as Amelia said, our team has developed this podcast called Food Security for Peace, which is the outcome of an applied research project on food security and peace is building in collaboration with FAO, uh, and now it is part of the official podcast series of the Geneva Peace Week, uh, whose theme this year is Peace is Possible. Uh, and our podcast in particular falls in the sub-theme of cultivating the cooperation, environmental challenges and opportunities in a new age of insecurity. Uh, in fact, the climate crisis is significantly transforming the global security landscape by exacerbating the social, political, uh, and economic processes that can lead to instability and conflict. Uh, this situation has led to the emergence of climate security, which is basically a new area within uh, the, the broader security sector, which refers to conflict and security risks induced by climate variability. Um, this podcast uh, aims at increasing understanding of how agriculture and food systems are linked to climate and conflict dynamics uh, and explores pathways to which food security and agricultural interventions can actually support the dual process of building resilience to climate change on the one hand and on the other hand uh, sustaining peace. Uh, this has been done by hearing from uh, different experts uh, in less than 20 minutes. And I want to report to you that, uh, for example, Amelia and I moderated the, the session and we used my phone to record it. And the quality <laughs> was really good. So it's a device that uh, I think everyone has and it's pretty accessible. There's no uh, <laughs> crazy requirement, crazy skill to have. Also, the speakers were working from all around the world. They were uh, working in liaison offices from Africa, South America, and each of them could send their contribution from their own own, from their own working station. So this is to tell you that it wasn't complicated at all. Uh, of course, the research aspect was, but not the <laughs> podcast in their self edited it. So it's something that everyone can do. Uh, so don't be afraid. And if you have something to share, uh, please do it, please go ahead. Because as Francisca said before, uh, awareness starts from us. So it's us uh, that should start uh, change. And uh, mm -hmm. if we can just move to the next slide, I just wanna show you that there are also other podcasts. Uh, these that are in the slides are about uh, food security crisis. Uh, but as Amelia said, you can learn about literally everything. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also another slides of examples. Um, but so yeah, the, the message, the takeover message I want to leave you with is that uh, podcasts are a great, great way to learn and to uh, spread knowledge about a, a, a topic. And they are very easy both to listen to and to produce. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, I mean, I just looked up on my Spotify account. You don't have to have a paid account. It can be the free one. Um, and they give you an option to search podcasts. And so you, I just typed in hunger crisis and food security. And these are just a few of 
the many, many that were available um, from all over the world, different perspectives. And so we just wanted to highlight that. Um, we do, we did have a couple of um, questions um, for the audience, but perhaps we can come back to them. I don't want to, um, I'm not sure where discussion questions come into the mix here, but. Um. No, but thank you so much for your presentation. It's really interesting. And thanks for sharing all the different podcasts. As yeah. well. we'll, I'll definitely have to check them out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, we're kind of behind schedule, yeah. but we'll quickly go to the open discussion. So sorry, your questions, we can start off with that. Um, okay, yeah. yeah just, um, the questions were really yeah helpful. that's okay so they were just very very basic um and i was wondering if anyone in here listens to podcasts regularly i do yeah <laughs> <you did. laughs> yeah yeah um do you do podcasts that are more um like hobby hobby related or like news related or both 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 yeah i get a lot of my news from podcasts i listen to the daily which is a new york times mm -hmm. podcast um every week every they, they come out every day um and they deep dive into a topic and so um what i really like about that is you can um really learn a lot about one thing and have a depth of knowledge um so a question for all of you what what does a podcast have to bring to the table or what gets you to click on it i think the length if it's not if it's too long i will not listen to it <laughs> pragmatic answer. Yeah. Our podcast is 17 minutes. So yeah, what, what's, 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 yeah, I was going to say, I what's good for 10 to 15. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. cool. Sorry. Are there any other criteria? It has to have a good picture. Oh, yeah. That's like a logistical thing that people have to think about. <laughs> I hope ours has a good picture. <laughs> we should double check on that. Um, great. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Um, does anyone want to respond to any presentations or any of the speakers? We have one question in the chat, um, which is what policy mechanisms would have a positive effect in retaining youth in the agriculture sector in developing economies? Um, Dominique, would you like to... Well, I'm not able to speak on behalf of the youth, but, uh, but, but I think perhaps give my two cents on that. And, uh, and, and you know, perhaps taking it from where uh, Amelia and Ambra left it, uh, you are talking of podcast, means you are talking to basically, you know, everybody has access to internet. And mm -hmm. everybody is able to compare each other's lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And uh, including in the developing countries, people have access to internet and, and compare with your lifestyle, uh, lifestyle across the world. So I think one of the, the key things uh, we have to work towards to ensure uh, people can remain in the agriculture sector is to ensure that they have access to decent uh, life, decent livelihood, that they are not just uh, doing uh, what we call subsistence farming, but that they can take a decent livelihood out of that. And for that, there is a number of things that political will. There is a need for political will at global level, political will that is informed by you being at the table, the youth, and, and to have a number of elements like, like training. Training is very important, training at all levels, to have uh, market opportunities, make sure that you have access to market, that there is the minimum infrastructure that is there, that that the youth have access to, to technologies and innovation, uh, that they can network, that they can exchange with whoever across the world, that uh, we are talking of uh, you know, digitalization, digital agriculture. I feel is a big program that is called uh, the 1000 Digital Villages, where even in remote areas, we are ensuring access to digitalization. And, uh, and, and I think this is more and more important. And then also in the developing world, I mean, especially with the impact of climate change, disease, etc., people are very vulnerable to shocks. So it's very important that, yes, if they remain in the agricultural sector, if they invest in the agricultural sector, there is some sort of social protection that is there to protect them against those shocks so that if there is a big drought or flood, they don't lose any, everything and have to restart from scratch. So really, it's about a combination of everything. But this is my view for a guy who is over 50. <laughs> Twice your age, perhaps. No, but that's where we also. Yeah, we have to work together. Yeah. Um, so we're yes, we're a little bit behind. So I'll quickly hand over to my other co-moderator, Matthew. Oh, yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I may. Okay. 
Yeah, yeah. I would like to react to Francisca's presentation. Uh, I believe personally, and at Unitaire in Switzerland, we are a business organization. We do not believe that technology is the solution for farming. We believe that technology will bring even more debt to the peasants and increase the dependence towards uh, big enterprises. And we think that we need to improve the autonomy of the peasants and the uh, financial autonomy is very, very important. We also uh, believe that uh, with technology, only the big farms will be able to follow this trend. And with that, yeah. we, we will lose even more farms. We are losing a lot of farms, especially here in, in Switzerland. And what we need is um, people to produce food for local markets, for local uh, population, and not for the agribusiness. And I would just like to say that, uh, yeah, it's the agribusiness that is killing our peasantry. And it's important to, to have that in mind. Um, Thank you. Can I answer that? Or uh, we are with full time? I think we're running out of time, so I'll just start with the, the second question, but I'm sure we'll have time to talk about it more if, if, if we have time, right? Okay. So, um, yes. all right, well, thank you for the discussion. It was very uh, insightful. So I'm Mathilde Bordic, and I also work here at the um, FPO liaison office in Geneva. And for this part, the second part, we'll discuss uh, engagement. But before we uh, jump to our speakers, we're gonna have the, the Mentimeter, so um, I would like to um, ask uh, you, our audience, um, what you think on this question. So what is the most um, important support that you should receive to be engaged in agri-food uh, systems? So there's uh, six um, options. You have to rank them in the one which you think is the most uh, important, to the least uh, important. And then you have time to do it while the, the speakers uh, will present. So I'll let you uh, have a look at it. And um, in the meantime, so um, to the speakers of this session, we're, um, I'm asking you the following question, which is how can we engage with the youth to be actively involved um, in discussing the issues, sharing knowledge and um, identifying solutions? So to answer these questions, um, we're very happy to have uh, Alberto Silva from uh, Uniter uh, who will uh, start with the, these uh, questions. So uh, please, uh, Alberto. Uh, we will get back to the results of the Mentimeter after all the presentations. Yes. I'm trying to share my screen. Okay. Here we go. So you can hear me, you can see my screen, it's all good. Yes, perfectly. So I'll be talking for UNITER. So as I said, it's a peasants organization and I work for UNITER at 60%. And next to it, I'm a peasant myself as I grow and sell organic vegetables. I will try Today in this uh, little speak, I'll try to explain the way people can access to agricultural land in Switzerland and how we can improve this difficult situation. As we know, uh, access to land for young people aspiring to engage in agricultural production, especially for those not inheriting farm, is a challenge, a very difficult challenge. I will uh, start by presenting you a few paradoxes. So in Switzerland, we have a large number of farms that stop their activities because farming is not a sustainably profitable activity. While in the meantime, some young people struggle to find to take over due to some strong constraints, and I will present this, uh, strong constraints later. And uh, in the meantime, more people obtain the certification to run a farm than there are farms available in Switzerland. So it's important to keep these uh, elements in mind. So in Switzerland, uh, for activities being officially recognized as farming and eligible for receiving the state's direct payments, a uh, farmer does, uh, does not just requ require land, but at least one member with a certifi certified agriculture education, a bill accounting as agricultural infrastructures, machines, and of course the money to finance all of these elements. So the first uh, strong, the, the first constraints uh, is the um, social and it's the dominant logic of family agriculture and its associated heritage structure. There is a gender dimension very important here uh, to access land in Switzerland. Uh, historically, daughters and wives are disadvantaged, disadvantaged in matters related to the farm, including uh, successions. Uh, often, retiring farmers continue living on the farm while selling or leasing uh, the land to other farmers. 
very often also young farmers uh, rent farms, which leads to an uncertainty of the medium term future. And uh, these young farmers aim to work as collective, which is not permitted by the law. I'll talk about that uh, later. So the farm takeover of one child within the family is uh, very easy, it's uh, very facilitated, but it restrains outsiders of the family from performing the farming uh, profession, particularly if you seek organization models other than family agriculture. Uh, the second constraints are linked to the laws we have here in Switzerland. So are three main laws uh, that govern agricultural land. Uh, I will not uh, speak about the details of it. I don't think we have time and it's not the purpose here. So the three laws uh, are the Spatial Planning Act. Uh, and this law is uh, le leads to a clear differentiation between zones. And we have to know that in the agricultural zones, the possibilities for new construction strictly limited, even though these constructions um, are meant to, to produce food. Uh, the second one is the agricultural land law, and uh, the third one is the law on agricultural leaves. It's very, very technical, and I'm not going into details of this. So these laws, uh, what we see is that these laws favor transition for farmers within the family, as I said, and in case of a lack of interest within the family, it's leased neighboring farmers. Um, when the farm is sold to a family member, uh, the agricultural land law provides that it can be done under the return value and outside the family, uh, people are required to pay the market value, which is around two and a half times higher. So it can be very, very difficult, very expensive to buy, uh, to buy a farm and lands. Um, the effect is that very little land and even fewer farms become available and financially accessible for aspiring farmers who do not inherit those uh, infrastructures. These laws also pose constraints on more collective modes of farming, as I said, and if a group of people wishes to farm together, they cannot do so as a collective or association, but they need to have they need to form a private uh, limited company and designate one member, one member who has an um, agricultural education to be the principal farmer. So what we see uh, with, these, uh, with these laws is that they ensure the protection of existing farmer families, but they are not aimed to create new generations of peasants and it's what we need right now. Uh, the third constraint is uh, economic constraints, of course, um, and uh, the, 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 the main one of these is the meager income and the low uh, profitability of farming. And we see in Switzerland that since the liberalization of the agricultural system, farms expand is an answer to the market pressures. However, as farms grow, not only the number of farms for potential takeovers reduce, but those that persist are even more expensive for new generations of farmers due to their larger sizes. The bigger they are, the more expensive they are, of course. So it is generally the already biggest and most profitable farm farms that take over grid land. So a farmer is big and he can and gets bigger. Um, renting rather than buying a farm is as it's it can be a strategy, but comes with further insecurities, especially if the rent contract is for a limited period of time. And we see young people that engage in uh, in planting trees, for example, as they, they do not know if they're going to stay there for 10, 20 years. And parallel to all of that, we need to improve the economic situation of Swiss farmers through uh, fair prices of their food products. Um, access to land is not a singular issue that can be solved by making more land physically av available, but for access to land to be fulfilled in a manner that allows new generations of farms to make use of it in a sustainable way, it requires several social, legal and economic conditions. The United Nations Declaration of the Right of Peasants, uh, what we call UN DROP, uh, was adopted in 2018 and is meant to improve these conditions. And for this, the states and the Swiss state uh, has a great responsibility. And in this uh, declaration, we have the Article 17, it's the right to land. Uh, and it's stated that peasants have the right to land uh, individually and or collectively. It's very important, including the right to have access to sustainably use and manage land. 
And as I say, uh, as I said, states should take appropriate measures to carry out agrarian reforms. And it's what we really need right now in, in Switzerland. So what we need or what we want <laughs> is um, extra familial, familial farm system. We need an opening in the law for more collective juridical forms to run farms outside the dominant family model, uh, especially for people outside of agricultural families. And as I said, and it's very important for us at uh, UNITER, it's to improve the economic situation of farming to enhance uh, the value and the importance of the farming profession and the importance to produce food, as I said, for local population. So to finish, what do we want? Does Switzerland want to keep on the path of the natural loss of farms, which it's nothing natural, it's just consequences of our um, politics? Or, the, or do we want diversified, sustainable, and resilient agriculture for generations to come? I think we have a very important choice to make right now. And the view and drop can function as a guiding document for the path to food sovereignty. Uh, at UNITER, we don't like to talk about food security. We prefer to talk about food sovereignty, which is not really the, the same thing. So to conclude, I would like to say that ensuring continued and widespread access to land for new generations of farmers is crucial to upholding a peasant agriculture and food sovereignty. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Alberto. It was very nice uh, to hear about uh, this issue of access to farm for the youth. I think it's a very important issue, so it was uh, really interesting. And now just to remind all the speakers, we're a bit behind, so please try to stick to your to your time so we it goes very smoothly um so <laughs> no worries so thank you so much for, for your presentation and now um so i'll give the floor to uh tanya Carillo from uh, bay of vision so please um over to you tanya yes thank you very much let me share my screen so you should be could you please confirm that you can yes we see it and we hear you Okay, that's perfect. So thank you again and good morning, afternoon and everyone from my side as well. Um, my name is Tanya Carrillo and I'm part of the policy and advocacy team here at BioVision. Um, so in my short input, I will tell you a bit about our work on agroecology, its importance for youth and also about the multi-stakeholders platforms that we support in Kenya. So, BioVision is a foundation based on development, as I said, and we were funded in 1998 by Dr. Hans Hern. And the vision that we're working towards is a world with enough food for all produced by healthy people in, an, in a healthy environment. And to achieve this vision, we work at different levels. Uh, on one side in Sub-Saharan Africa, where we develop and disseminate participatory agroecological methods for improved food security and more sustainable resource use in countries like Burundi, Ethiopia, Kenya, Malawi, Uganda, Tanzania, and Zimbabwe. Then also in Switzerland, where we contribute to the implementation of the 2030 agenda, focusing on food systems and sustainable consumption, and at the international and national policy level, where we advocate for an agroecological transformation and bring together decision makers at different scales. So why do we support agroecology. Um, at BioVision, we see agroecology as a pathway to sustainability. It is simultaneously a practice, a science, and a movement that offers a set of principles that can transform agricultural practices and the entire food system. It's a holistic approach that creates synergies between animals, plants, microorganisms, and soils that lead to a diversified agroecological farming and can contribute to resilience, food security, healthy food, and local value generation. Um, these aspects are all, um, sorry. Um, yeah, so these aspects are all extremely relevant for the younger generations. Um, and just last week, actually, the youth, the Committee on World Food Security, the CFS, endorsed the policy recommendations on promoting youth engagement and employment in agriculture and food systems for food security and nutrition. Um, the policy recommendations emphasize that while young people are critical to promote 
adopting sustainable food systems, they face many challenges that hinder their engagement and employment in agriculture. So agroecology has the potential to create perspectives for the rural youth to work in agriculture, thanks to its knowledge intensity and its explicit focus on social values, such as equity and co-creation. And since it's more labor intensive than conventional and industrial agriculture, it can also create new jobs and income perspectives, um, thereby incentivizing youth, young people to start a career in agriculture. Um, Additionally, agriculture practices play a vital role in increasing climate resilience, which is crucial for all generations, but especially for young people entering the agricultural sector, since they will have to deal with the effects of, clim of the climate crisis for a longer time. And a recent report by the high-level panel of experts on food security and nutrition, the HLPE, um, that was also the basis for their policy recommendations I talked about before. They explicitly mention agroecology as a key component and recommend policies related to agroecological principles, like, for example, participatory <laughs> governance. Sorry. No, um, and promoting participatory policy processes is also one of the key aspects of our work at the policy and advocacy team of BioVision. Um, through local partners in Kenya, like ICE, Palom, and Caritas Meru, uh, we support multi stakeholder platforms at the national and sub national level in Kenya and also in Uganda. The objective of these platforms is to promote the inclusion and participation of diverse actors in food systems related uh, policy processes, whereby a particular focus lies on empowering smallholder farmers, women, and also youth groups. So on the slide, you can see the logos of two of the national uh, level MSPs in Kenya. On one side, you have the Intersectoral Forum on Agroecology and Agrobiodiversity. Uh, is far in short, uh, which provides a platform through which stakeholders at the intersection of biodiversity, conservation, and agricultural production can interact to discuss, share knowledge, information, influence policy, fundraise, implement joint programs, as well as monitor and, and review progress towards mainstreaming agroecology. And on the other side, we have the multi-stakeholder platform for climate small, smart agriculture, the CSA MSP, where membership to the platform is open to government, public sector, private sector, research, farmer organizations, NGOs, and also development partners. And then also we sometimes organize workshops to enhance the synergies between these different platforms, um, working on agroecology, like the one that is shown in this picture. So I'm gonna stop here and take off time and um, open for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tanya. It was uh, very interesting to hear well, obviously the importance of climate resilience and the importance of being included in policy processes. Uh, yeah, it was uh, very insightful. And so now we'll hear from um, Ulda Masese, she's from the World Association of Girl Guides and Girl Scouts. So uh, please, uh, Ulda, uh, over to you. And uh, Judy will um, show you slides. I think she disconnected. Is Ulda still there? If she's not, we can just move on. Yeah, we will come back. Yeah, so we'll come back to uh, Ulda um, later. And therefore, uh, this time we'll hear from uh, Francine Beatrice Prades. She's also from the World Association of Girl, Scali, Girl Guides and uh, Girl Scouts. So please, uh, Francine, please uh, go ahead. Thanks, Mathilde. And warm greetings to everyone. I'm Francine. I'm from the Philippines and an advocacy champion of the Girl Proud Nutrition Program of WAGS. The Girl Proud Nutrition Program is created by the World Association of Girl Guides and Girl Scouts and funded by Nutrition International to end the intergenerational cycle of malnutrition. It is launched in four pilot countries, mainly the Philippines, Tanzania, Sri Lanka, and Madagascar. So on to the question that we're supposed to answer right now. So how can we engage with you for them to be actively involved in discussing relevant issues regarding agri-food systems transformation, sharing knowledge, and identifying solutions? 
Well, with that, I want to draw your attention to a quick reflection point, which is the youth. Just why we're all here today, because we're all young people looking forward to engaging other young people as well. But the key thing here is not just Y O U T H, it's you. And <laughs> there is everything starts with you, with us. And one of the answers that we're looking into when we talk about engaging young people isn't necessarily looking into a one size fits all solution. It's also about acknowledging um, our experiences on the ground, working with young people, our peers, and what they have to say with regards to their participation on matters related to their own nutrition. So for us, it starts with acknowledging their lived experience and seeing them as equals, as partners, instead of being beneficiaries to our collective efforts to bring about global change. And so I would like to share something that we've been doing in the Philippines. And it started with a community project that we did back in August 2014. I think I was about 14 years old back then. It was already a critical issue for our community because there were already high rates of malnutrition. And what we did is we started a one-year feeding program that catered to over 35 children based in a community with the highest rates of malnutrition. From then, a few years after, during the pandemic, we decided to launch a salad garden to encourage young girls um, around the Philippines to be able to provide for themselves and for their communities, especially as access to healthy and nutritious foods started to dwindle. But it's not just that. I think one of the key things that we were able to do during the pandemic, wherein the GPN really thrived and prospered, is creating the Put Your Best For Forward. You can see the logo in the middle. It's a national online educational program that teaches young girls about adult nutrition and what they can do to end the intergenerational cycle of malnutrition. One of the key points that we were able to do was we were able to lobby our Ministry of Health or the Department of Health in the Philippines to stringently implement um, the Department um, Order Number 13 series of 2017 together with the Ministry of Education, which lays out guidelines on selling and marketing food products within school systems. And aside from that, we were able to tap in um, unique platforms such as TikTok and other activities that the girls are interested in. One of the things that I've learned while working with young people isn't just that we have to create programs continuously. It's also about creating programs that are interesting to them and relevant to what they are doing and experiencing in their daily lives. So you might be wondering, how are we able to create all of these things? Well, first, we connected with our target community. We consulted with experts from the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Education, and nutritionists. And we consolidated this information. So here are some of the other things that we've been doing as well and the lessons that we were able to gain. So during um, August or I think October 2019, they sent youth leaders um, to Sweden for the Unlock Leadership for Change training. And we were able to learn about the sustainable development goals. Specifically for my case, I focused on zero hunger. And then um, a year after we met with Greenpeace Philippines to engage the youth in the classrooms for future, where we talked about zero kilometer food among others. Those two cases highlighted something that's really important. It's providing young people with access to resources that shall give them the extra push they need to create collective action. In this slide, you can see Mission Nutrition. It's a session we created during the Global Youth Summit um, with the Global Youth Mobilization that focused on exploring the disproportionate effect of the COVID-19 pandemic on adolescent nutrition. We did this in collaboration with the World Health Organization Special Envoy for COVID-19, Dr. David Navarro. And we had girls from all over the world, not just girls really, but everyone um, across all borders, across all genders, and across all ages, participate in us in an interactive session on adolescent nutrition. We also had a, on the next slide, the Yunga Nutrition Lab recently, to equip girls with the information to truly learn about their bodies and their health. And this emphasizes the increase in the visibility of our advocacy across different platforms. Finally, we have the third 
UN or United Nations Science Policy Business Forum, where I attended as a representative of the United Nations Environment Program, major group for children and the youth, to talk about adolescent nutrition, specifically in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. And finally, we invited girls all over the world to join us in the 65th Commission on the Status of Women to amplify the calls on adolescent nutrition and how they are disproportionately impacted by what's happening around them. And I think one of the things that I take pride in is the badge launch since um, in the Girl Power Nutrition Program, after you complete the activities and get to interact with the communities, you receive a badge to commemorate your volunteer work. So we were able to invite decision makers from all over the Philippines to bring to the table the concerns of their constituents. And this highlights the need for young people to be included in decision making to make sure that they are heard in public spheres of um, society and that their concerns aren't taken lightly. So overall, to cap my reply or my answer on how we can engage young people to be actively involved in discussing the issues on agri-food systems transformation, I think all of us have a shared collective role in ensuring that we have not just food security, but what um, Alberto mentioned earlier is about food sovereignty as well, um, and to leave no one behind. But to make that happen, we have to utilize our leadership capacity and our skill sets to advance our advocacies and uphold systems that promote positive, impactful youth engagement. So thank you so much for having me. And if you ever have any questions or ideas that you would like to share, you can connect with me through the following platforms. Thank you, Francine. Uh, it was a very uh, good presentation teaching young girls on malnutrition, even the partnership you talked about with the Ministry of Health and Education. Um, and then you talked also with the experts, super um, inspiring. And then you, you talked about leaving no one behind to our World Food uh, Day theme. So I uh, couldn't agree more. Uh, and now we'll jump to, we'll, I think, Hulda is back, right? Wait, yes. So uh, Hulda, please um, go ahead. Hi, everyone. I'm Hulda Masese from Kenya. That's the Kenya. I'm representing the Kenya Girl Guides Association. And then, uh, as a girl guide, I've been ex uh, as I visit schools, uh, children will be like, "We don't have enough food at our home. We don't have this." So I requested them, "Can you, as a, an advocate champion for plastic tight turners, can we use the available plastics for garden farming?" And they agreed. And here is the representation of what you've done for the past six months in Kenya. Maybe you can help me share the presentation, please. Yes, do you see it? Uh, we see it, so. So this is the slide one, please. Um, Hulda, this yes? slide or the previous one? The first one, the previous one. Oh, this. Okay, let's, a minute, a minute. So, on uh, what we are doing, yes, if I can answer the question. How to engage with the youth to be actively involved in discussing issues, sharing knowledge, and identifying solutions. The existing youth groups should be actively involved in discussing issues, should be trained to identify the causes of hunger, crisis, in short and long term effects of the society, and to be impacted with relevant knowledge. So let's say the SDG, where we have zero poverty, zero hunger, life below water, and life on land. Through the trainings, we can give suggestions on what can be improved and how it can be implemented at grassroots levels. These engagements can be done by fellow advocacy champions from within the community. I'm suggesting the, from the community as a way to avoid language burden and avoid distortion of information. The advocacy champion will get the first hand facts and findings uh, with the community change makers for implementation. 
So I've been advocating for guided farming in uh, my community by reusing of plastic containers found in homes and school environment. The school children have implemented the idea in schools and homes. Youth, the youth groups have also reached out for long discussion on garden farming as a way of improving food production in our locality. Going forward, more youth are coming on board to share ideas of garden farming because they believe that what had started in schools should be implemented in the community at large. And I can say that the steps we have made in our community have been greatly impacted by the work leadership model, whereby collaborative mindset of listening to various views and sharing creative ideas that motivates us to work as a team will enable us to be more proactive in a society. In conclusion, I can say that garden farming can be done in rural homes and even in towns. So the people in towns and in rural places kindly use that plastic container in your locality to produce more vegetables. Uh, on the pictures, if you can share for the Nyagachi Primary School, this one was a Sitsani Primary School where we started, and then we have another one. Next slide. Yes, this school is called Nyagachi Primary School. When I started off the project, they, they, they accepted the project, and I can assure, I can assure you that uh, at the Nyagachi Primary School, they were able to sell the, the, the surplus food, and uh, they were able to get some uh, shoes for two grade four students. So it's an initiative that will create food security in our homes because some have already started practicing it in their homes. And then at the end of the day, it's not about food, food, food. There's that selling of surplus to get something as an income generating an opportunity. If, we, if our youths decide that we have to practice guided farming, even the ones in urban areas, at least we'll have a hint that there's, there is a, a chance that we have uh, and harvest, not necessarily because we have land, but because we've utilized the local available materials to produce land. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Hilda, for sharing with us like this project of uh, community gardens and garden in schools. Um, super interesting. Um, so, maintenant, je vais passer donc euh, en français. Alors, euh, on parle de l'engagement des jeunes. Nos participants, donc, nous Panélistes, ils ont discuté de, des défis auxquels font face les jeunes en Suisse pour devenir agriculteurs, euh, de l'engagement des jeunes en agroécologie, donc l'agriculture euh, des jardins communautaires ou dans les écoles. On a aussi donc parlé de, de différents projets faits avec l'Association mondiale euh, des guides et des, des éclaireuses pour sensibiliser les femmes euh, et les filles à la nutrition, projet de classe pour le futur. Donc tout ça en considérant les jeunes comme étant égaux, des partenaires donc, pour créer un monde euh, plus durable. Et donc, euh, donc ça, c'est un peu donc, tout ce qu'on vient de dire un peu dans, dans cette question, sur cette, sur cette session. Et puis, donc maintenant, c'est la dernière, mais non la moindre. Euh, je vais donner la parole donc, à Joy Marlene Codo, qui vient de l'Association mondiale des guides et des éclaireuses. Donc, Joy, euh, la parole est à toi. Okay, bonsoir. Bonjour à tous. J'espère que ça va. Moi, c'est Joy Marlene Codo. Je représente la MGE. Dire que c'est bon. Hein. Ok. Donc, par rapport à la question comment pouvons-nous nous engager avec les jeunes, je pense qu'il est d'abord primordial de. Je pense qu'il est primordial d'abord de revenir sur la sensibilisation parce que c'est important que les jeunes puissent réellement maîtriser ce qu'on appelle la faim, les problématiques qui sont liées. Quand on parle de système agroalimentaire durable, résilient, la notion qu'ils puissent réellement maîtriser ça et puis qu'ils puissent comprendre les enjeux qui y sont liés et qu'ils sachent qu'ils peuvent être des acteurs de changement et qu'ils réellement et qu'ils s'engagent réellement dans cette lutte et ainsi s'engager pour moi avec les jeunes c'est leur créer des opportunités où ils puissent prendre part aux échanges créer des groupes de discussion des rencontres physiques ou virtuelles où les jeunes seront réellement associés pour pouvoir donner leurs idées donner des approches de solutions à cette problématique. Ça serait aussi bien de mettre en place des programmes ou des projets et les associer depuis la mise 
en place la création, l'élaboration des stratégies jusqu'à la réalisation. Et c'est cette approche qui a été utilisée par le WAX dans un certain nombre de programmes dont le GLA, Girl Light Action of Climate Change et le GPN, Girl Power Nutrition, qui sont des programmes qui constituent déjà une opportunité aux filles de pouvoir militer dans cette lutte contre le changement climatique ou la malnutrition. Et ces programmes sont assez sur trois grandes phases. Une première partie qui est le Learn, où les filles partent des packs d'activités assez interactifs, assez collaboratifs. Elles apprennent sur la problématique, comment est-ce que cela les affecte et également qu'elles peuvent agir. Et on passe à la deuxième phase qui est le Take Action, où les filles proposent des idées, proposent des solutions et elles sont accompagnées pour la mise en œuvre l'exécution. Et lorsqu'elles se rendent compte qu'elles n'ont pas à elles seules la possibilité d'agir, elles décident alors de porter leur voix, le speak out, où elles portent la, leur voix et celle des autres filles également vers les autorités, les preneurs de décision pour ce qui puisse influencer leur projet ou leur décision à l'endroit des filles. Et comme elles sont palpables dans le cadre du CLAC, le Learn, les filles, par elles-mêmes, parce que c'est un programme par et pour les filles. Les filles ont par elles-mêmes appris à d'autres filles ce qu'est le changement climatique, comment est-ce que ça touche la fille et qu'elles peuvent agir à travers des activités, des packs d'activités assez collaboratifs en utilisant la méthode éducative non formée. Et de là, lorsque les filles ont réellement pris conscience, elles ont eu à proposer des idées, mettre en place des actions communautaires, Tel est le cas où des filles d'une région par elles-mêmes ont pris le lead. Elles sont allées voir des autorités de leur région, les eaux et forêts. Elles ont négocié des plans d'arbres, mille plans d'arbres. Elles ont mobilisé d'autres filles et d'autres jeunes de leur région. Et ensemble, ils ont eu à faire un reboisement sur deux hectares avec mille plans d'arbres. Également, nous sommes en train dans une phase de plaidoyer où les filles ont décidé de porter leur voix auprès des dirigeants et une région a décidé de militer pour l'installation de forages parce que le changement climatique les a assez affectés et elles n'ont plus accès à de l'eau potable. Donc du coup, elles ont milité pour ce qu'on puisse leur créer un forage et donc garantir un accès à l'eau potable. Toutes ces actions montrent en fait que lorsque on implique les jeunes, lorsqu'on crée des opportunités aux jeunes pour pouvoir s'exprimer, pour pouvoir parler, ils se sentent réellement engagés et proposer des idées, proposer des solutions novateurs sont assez évident et assez clair pour eux. Donc, pour conclure, pour moi, s'engager avec les jeunes, c'est réellement leur créer des opportunités à travers des, des discussions, des programmes, des projets où ils se sentiront réellement impliqués dans la phase d'élaboration et également le lead leur donner pour la réalisation. Ainsi, on pourra garantir une solution ou des solutions pour la problématique de la faim et l'élaboration de systèmes agroalimentaires assez résilients et durables. Merci. Merci, Joy, pour la présentation. Donc, si je vais souligner quelques points, je pense euh, l'importance d'inclure euh, les filles, les femmes dans les, dans les projets, de les avoir dans la phase d'élaboration et euh, l'importance d'accompagner les jeunes tout au long vraiment, des, des projets, de et de leur parler de, de changement climatique notam notamment. Euh, super intéressant. Donc, um, so Joy, she talked to us about the importance of um, listening to youth, giving them spaces and uh, programs to discuss, and uh, empowering uh, young girls and women. And she shared with us the importance uh, to involve young girls in the whole process of a project. Um, and then implication is really a key uh, to success um, There, so thank you to all our speakers for this uh, session. Um, perhaps we can share exactly the results of uh, our Mentimeter. So we you had to rank six uh, six options, right, to to answer this this question. What is the most important support that youth uh, should receive to be engaged in agri food systems? And we can see the first one uh, was uh, that people chose is education and training followed by uh, involvement in policy dialogues and access to and water. Perhaps we have, uh, we're running late, but perhaps we have uh, a bit of time. Um, Tanya, if you'd like to 
to tell us which one you would you would choose uh, as the first one and why. If I think Tanya is still there, yes. Do you think you could uh, perhaps tell, tell us which one you you would choose uh, as the yeah. first one? If I would have to, to rank them, you mean? Um, yes. I, I was thinking a lot, a long time about that before the, when preparing for that event as well. And honestly, it's, it's a very hard thing. Uh, it's, it's very hard because I think that for a systemic change, all of them are, are, are very important. So I think they need to happen all at the same time. So we need the education and the training. Um, from what we do at BioVision, I mean, we do have a strong focus on the involvement in policy dialogues because I think it is extremely important to have young people on that table um, to voice their interests, to be part of making these policy developments. But at the same time, in the agricultural sector, you need they need the access to land uh, that Alberto was, was talking about as well, and then also the access to finance and markets to be able to, to produce their food. Um, so yeah, no concrete answer from my side, but I think from a systemic perspective, it's important to have these all happening at the yeah, parallel. Answer. Yes, yes, thank you. I think uh, it's a very good answer, and it's very hard to, to actually rank them. Perhaps, uh, Francine, would you like to give it a go and give your two thoughts on this question? Sure thing. It's interesting for me to look at the um, poll and see education and training because this is something that I do agree with. Um, specifically that education and training, it's not that young people do not want to be engaged. It's, it's because there is a lack of resources for them to actually be engaged, whether it is and having the opportunities to be engaged or being equipped with the resources and creating and knowledge back to um, engage with people, with decision makers and um, implement projects or activities that they're interested in. So thank you so much, Mathilde, for tapping me with this. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to thank um, all of our speakers for this session. So Alberto, Tanya, Ulda, Francine, Joy. Merci, Joy, pour la présentation. So thank you, everyone, for sharing uh, your project and what you've been uh, working on. And uh, now I'll give the floor to Shawif to moderate uh, our last session. Thank you, Mato. My name is Xiao Yiwa, I'm Junior Liaison Specialist at FAO Geneva. And uh, for the third part, we'll discuss agri-food system transformation. So before giving the floor to our discussants, I would like to invite all of you to participate in our last mental middle question. What solutions can you propose in driving the sustainable transformation of agri-food systems? So this is the open question. And uh, your participants, maybe you could draw inspiration from the following presenters, and we will come back to your answers in the open discussion session later. While you're thinking about it and writing down your thoughts, I'm now posing a question to our discussants here. In your opinion, how can the youth act as agents of change and drive sustainable transformation of agri food systems to support the SDGs and end hunger? We are delighted to have with us today young thinkers from the Graduate Institute and Fadi Peter on Paul. So first, I will give the floor to Martin Zolk and India Balgarbi from the Graduate Institute. Uh, it's great. Thank you very much for this very interesting and important question. And I think obviously there's lots of ways where youth can act as agents of change, and I'm really looking forward to well as well what the others have to say. Um, so I think we focus again on personal experience in our project, and I think what we've been learning through the project uh, that Amelia and Amber have already been touching upon is that um, actually youth can act, act as agents of change uh, through the creation of uh, spaces of collaboration uh, between both youth and older generations. Uh, so as Harris puts it quite nicely in the quote, so the beauty of collaboration between older and younger generations is that we combine strength with wisdom. Uh, and so I think throughout the project, we, we really appreciate it. Uh, I mean, big, big quote. <laughs> you, can, uh, you can interpret, but um, I think so. I mean, we, we really enjoyed collaborating and I think it was a great learning process for us. And so in this way, um, sort of we hope that at the end we have the knowledge uh, to contribute uh, sort of also to change in the end, because the creation of spaces for exchange and learning uh, between youth and older generations is, I think, uh, a powerful vehicle for equipping the youth um, to have actually the necessary tools to then drive the transformation in the in the next generation. So as Ibo Scalia puts it, a change is the end result of all true learning. 
And at the same time, we also think that it's a mutually beneficial relationship that can maybe also inform the thinking of the older generations and allow them to form the change makers of tomorrow. Um, and so spaces for this exchange and learning can take many forms, uh, such as informal meetings, uh, formal collaborations, or I mean discussion panels such as this one, which is a very nice opportunity. Uh, but India is going to talk a, a little bit more about a project, which was sort of one specific, uh, one specific example of this collaboration. So I give it over to India. Thanks. Yes. So basically at our university, what we have is called the Applied Research Project. So we get into groups and our university matches us with an international organization uh, here in Geneva. Uh, and what we do is we do research to help organizations uh, tackle real life problems uh, that they want to address. So our team is working with the FAO. Uh, and what we did is we had, uh, on our hand, we had the opportunity to, to learn a lot from experienced practitioners. And on the other hand, uh, uh, the FAO benefit from our research capacity and uh, the solution that we provide to them. And so what we did, that is our, our project, so our research examined how uh, food and agriculture interventions can contribute to peace and security. Uh, so we're working on the nexus between uh, peace, climate, and security uh, while gaining a little bit of professional experience. Uh, and so we made a podcast. Uh, right now we're working on a report that we're going to uh, give out to the FAO. Uh, along with a little brief uh, with our recommendations. And that is it. If you are, if you're interested, you can contact us if you have any questions. Uh, and yeah, go listen to our podcast. <laughs> Thank you so much. As a previous graduate student, I think I myself also benefit a lot from the capstone project with the international organization. So thank you for sharing us with your uh, experience of this exciting project with FAO. And uh, now we will hear from Kalma Niffenlager and Mark Philip Neff from Fadi Peter and Paul. So Kalma and Mark Philip, please the floor is yours. What is this uh, podcast available on Spotify? Or? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah we can send Does it have a nice picture? I know. That's <laughs> <laughs> now I, I'm worried. At least it's too, too long. <laughs> oh, okay. We didn't pick the picture. You can still adjust. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will introduce y'all to a tool we use to create sustainable camps um, during our scout camps in summer and other times. Uh, it's called Fair Camp. Uh, the original title is Fair Slago. Um, it's basically a platform or a tool that focuses on making sustainable youth camps available to all camps in Switzerland and other countries, of course. Um, it's a tool that creates playful and constructive approaches to sustainable solutions. It offers games to learn about socio-economic and socio-demographic differences how they were created, their causes, and how we can overcome them. It also offers a lot of interactive workshops uh, to tackle with children and youth to teach them about sustainable lifestyles and their solution. Uh, yes, about sustainable lifestyles and how they can be applied in real life. There are options for rovers, chefs, trainers, and other potential interested parties to learn about different approaches that can be taken. For example, on the beginning of a camp, instead of taking public transportation or something else, you can hike. <laughs> <laughs> it's as simple as that. And um, they also offer a lot of recipes that uh, change out meat for other products that give recommendations on bio products and how to adjust food quantities during a camp. They leave tips and tricks on planning and implementing the proposed solutions on their website and give ways to actively involve children in the process of creating a better tomorrow. Thank you. Yes, I want to point out uh, one more example about our Federal Scouts camp uh, this year. I think the FAO was also there. And we had there a, a problem because we went there with uh, 25,000 Scouts to these local communities in uh, the valley and we were a lot of people and <laughs> you know we consume a lot of uh, a lot of meat and also a lot of water and therefore our objective uh, in the federal scouts camp was to save water that all we 
we have enough and also the local communities there uh, have enough water. So we had some solutions to, to save water. One of uh, these solutions was the water points. We hadn't like direct access to water from, from every group. We had like uh, 40 water points where the, where the groups could uh, receive fresh water for drinking, for cooking or washing up. And in my opinion, uh, I really think that drove awareness among the scouts, among the people, um, how water is a scarce resource and we must uh, take care of it as in the future maybe also with climate change. And we recycled um, our wastewater uh, we, we took our water there at the, at the points and then we, we washed we washed our dishes and then we uh, removed it to the water points and uh, there it get recycled. Yes, and <laughs> one other thing, uh, maybe that's, uh, yeah, uh, I, we had the, the, the showering time of the children was restricted. Mm -hmm. So uh, the children had only five minutes uh, per person and per week uh, for showering. <laughs> I think in normal life, it's, it's not possible, but yeah, it's normal with the scouts. You're not uh, showering a lot there. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there that, were a few good rains, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and uh, the adults could uh, shower every three days. It was like the rule, but I think some they, they did more. Yes. And lastly, we had also some, some special toilets to, without water. Yes. Then on to the next slide. Here we look at how the youth connect as agents of change um, in support of the SDGs. We thought of four solutions uh, that we can do on a group level. So we, as Padi Peter and Paul, could approach. Um, one of them is reflect a uh, reflection of the scouts and youth in the envi environmentally harmful eating habits. That is mostly the point that Raphael tackled earlier. We can change uh, maized meat for corn and stuff like that then rethink and change them and find alternatives. That is a thing we're heavily looking at at the moment. And at the moment, we have a team that is called DINKL. It stands for diversity and inclusion. And we try to think of, of, of we try to first see the problems and then in coordination with the other scout leaders, find solutions we can approach with the children so they can be aware that we are aware and trying mm -hmm. to change. And then acting as role models for society, as scout leaders, you have a certain reputation in society and that is also represented <laughs> <laughs> right here. <laughs> and I think it's very important to teach young children the importance of nature and food and life. And then as a fourth point, if we can teach our children about important things and about being sustainable, then they can go home and tell their parents about it. And maybe that creates a chain reaction that can change society as a whole. Yes, and maybe one more point about how the scouts or the youth could really act as agents of change. Uh, you see it on this graphic. Uh, I want to start with our scout school. We are 183 scouts. And if we move now, now one uh, level higher, we are above uh, about 50,000 scouts in Switzerland. And it's uh, really the biggest uh, movement or the biggest uh, movement of the youth in, in Switzerland. And if we go one level higher, uh, this is the World Organization uh, of the scout movement, we have around 57 million uh, scouts. Yeah, and for example, if the WASM now could establish uh, educational programs for for the scouts and uh, scout leader scout leaders about the SDGs, for example, um, the youth and the scouts could really act as as agents of change. I think they already do some some stuff, but I think there is. Uh, there could be also some progress or, for example, for the FEO, maybe uh, to work to get stronger or work together with the WASM to reach 
this uh, over 57 million scouts. Yes. Be, thank you for your att uh, attention. It was a pleasure for us to be here and to produce uh, uh, what we do in our scouts and our scouts, uh, scouts activities. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks so much. Thank you for this very informative. Well, and these are your names. No? Uh -huh. Do I say it in my side? Yeah, no. yeah, that's our scout. That are our scout names. <laughs> <laughs> And thank you for like letting us know, like Scouts Voice, in terms of how we can adapt to a sustainable lifestyle. And you also propose very interesting, innovative solutions. So very enjoy your presentation. And this is actually very related to our open discussion on Mentimeter. So let's go back to see the answers from our online participants. What solutions can use propose in driving a sustainable transformation of agri-food systems? So people are thinking of nature-based solutions, new farming technique, as we have discussed, and innovative farming, policy dialogue, and reduced weight, locality, like by local food, basically. So thanks so, so much for everyone participating in this online quiz. And um, because of the limited uh, time frame, so I'm afraid we need to move on. And thanks so much for all your insights. And now I will hand over to Judy for the summary and key messages. Judy, over to you. Thank you, Shawi. That was very informative. Um, thank you to all speakers for their contributions and the audience for the questions and comments. We have learned a lot today on ways youth can transform the agri-food system from creative cooking recipes to innovative podcasts that create engagement to youth in agroecology for sustainable farming. All these recommendations and more in the presentations have been enlightening, and we will follow up on this <clears throat> with the Youth Action Assembly of the World Food Forum, who can share our suggestions with policymakers. To wrap this up, I hope that all the work these young people are doing has inspired many and sparked interest <clears throat> around the future of our food and planet. I have a question to the audience to think about. What will you do to contribute to the transformation of agri-food systems? Big thanks to all our speakers, World Food Forum colleagues, and participants who have supported this dialogue. I hope you enjoy the rest of the World Food Forum program. <clears throat> and once again, sorry for my voice, I have flu, but thank you so much.